Maestro. Our service this morning for the Feast of Pentecost is the anti-communion to, to the Holy Eucharist. If you have the bulletin at home, you should have everything you need. If you are here and want to use a prayer book, we're beginning on page 355 in the Book of Common Prayer. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the most high, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, who on this day taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things to evermore rejoice in his holy comfort through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Reading from the book of Numbers. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And the young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of, the, of Israel returned to the camp. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 104, verses 25 to 35 and 37. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the great and wide sea, with its living things too many to number, creatures both small and great. There move the ships, and there is that never in them which you have made for the sport of it. All of them look to you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it. You open your hand and they are filled with good things. You hide your face and they are terrified. You take away their breath and they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit and they are created. And so you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord and the 
Savior forever. May the Lord rejoice in all his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and the smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. May these words of mine please him. I will rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Hallelujah. Second reading, Acts 2, 1, 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and in it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of a fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under the heaven, living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crown gathered and was bewildered, because each of one heard them speak in a native language. And it was what they hear, each of us, in their own native tongue. From Bactrians, Vietnamese, and Emilites, and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Capodia, Hodus and Asia, Arrogance and Amer Egypt and their parts, Liberia belonging to Cyrene and the visitors of Rome, both Jews and Proclites, Greeks and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speak about God's deeds and powers. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing in the eleventh, eleven, raised his voice and addressed men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what is spoken through the prophet Joel. Praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the last day, it will be God's declare that I will pour out my spirit upon the flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and the old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show forth in heaven above and sign on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to dark, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. More thanks be to God. Sorry about that. That's all right.
Glory to you, Lord Christ. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. So thank you all. I know this is different, and it's odd, and we are taking these first steps carefully and thoughtfully. I'm going to preach to you with my mask on, and hopefully with the mic and everything else you can hear me, so you can't look puzzled, and it will be just like a regular sermon. We are doing these things because we're trying to keep not just ourselves safe, but more importantly, we're trying to keep the community safe. I, I was saying to somebody that this, this virus has had a relatively minor impact on the majority of people that live in Rhode Island. But if you live in Central Falls, or you live in South Providence, it has had a huge impact on you. If you work in a hospital, or you work in a nursing care facility, or you have a relative in a nursing home, it has had a huge impact on you. And I think the fact that the impact has been unevenly felt across the state has led us to think that, well, this is a bunch of hype, and I don't have to take it seriously. Well, it isn't. And I tell you, as someone who is on the board of two nursing homes, that this is devastating. We've lost members of our staff, we've lost patients, and I don't know if nursing and nursing care is going to be the same going forward. So many people have struggled, people have lost their lives. We don't know that Central Falls is going to be the same way. We're able to reopen here in Providence. Central Falls is not reopening. San Jorge is going to be worshiping separately for a long time just not safe in that place that has a higher infection rate than Manhattan and Brooklyn and the Bronx had at the height of their infections. This is a difficult time, especially if you have to have a whole family living in a very small apartment. It's hard to keep pure. It's hard to keep safe. So I thank you for working with us in this time, this, this season that we will probably tell our grandchildren about our children about, and they will tell their children about what they remember about this world. And yet, in the midst of all of this, Christ has been risen, and the Spirit has been given. We are thinking about the implications of some of the things that are in the Gospel today, but the one that I'm particularly taken by is the fact that they start addressing very clearly Jesus as Lord. Peter quotes a line from the prophets and says, And in that day, when the Lord has come, in that day, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And in John's Gospel, Thomas is the one who, in the next part of this reading that we had, will be the first one to explicitly say, Jesus is Lord. It's in this appearance to the apostles in the closed and upper room that Jesus is fully revealed as who he is. Now that title Lord, a title Lord is not just something you say to people. You know, I notice that when people want something from me right now, they come up to me and they address me as your excellency. Oh, Bishop Nisley, your excellency, I need something from you. And I, I stop them and I say, okay, so here's the thing, I'm not an excellency. I'm not even close to being an excellency. And they say, well, that's right, right. You're, you're, you must be a grace. Oh, you're a grace. Like, no, I'm not a grace either. I'd have to be an archbishop to be a grace. I'm not a grace. Near as I can tell, and I look this up, near as I can tell, I'm really a lordship. 
So if, if you want to come up and flatter me, you're probably going to say, oh, your lordship. And I'm just going to look at you. Because don't call me that. The thing is, in America, we don't have that kind of language. We don't use that language because we made a political decision after the Revolutionary War that we were going to have lords. We were going to have graces. We were going to have excellencies or highnesses or royal highnesses. We were just going to call each other Mr. or Reverend or Doctor, whatever title was earned or bestowed, not something that was hereditary. When the disciples are using that term Lord to refer to Jesus, it's not anachronistic and it's not sort of a thing that they're doing to flatter. They're actually making a confession. When you call somebody Lord in that day, you meant that they were your king. And literally what you meant when you said that. And so when someone says Jesus is Lord in the Bible, when someone says Jesus is Lord in the early centuries of the church, they're saying that they recognize Jesus as their king, Jesus as their master. And they are denying the power of Caesar. They're denying the power of the local magistrates and governors. They're denying the power of the secular world that surrounds them. This is a huge thing when we say Jesus is Lord in that way. It is a clear recognition that we are part of a different community. As First Peter describes it, we are part of a dispersed community of people that are being brought into a new relationship with one another. You hear that in Acts, don't you? When they talk about all the different nations that are hearing the gospel proclaimed to them in their own language. God is reaching across nations, across secular divisions, and creating a new family and a new community. It is a new way of being human. It's a really big deal. People tell me that the church shouldn't speak politically. The thing is, the church began to speak politically on the day that it was born, on the day of Pentecost, and it continues to speak politically on now. We just have to learn to recognize what that language means when we say Jesus is Lord. Now, I say all this this morning after we had demonstrations here in Providence that, thanks be to God, did not turn terribly violent just into some sort of vandalism around the state capitol. But if you looked at the news this morning coming in, it was much worse in many parts of the country. Los Angeles, Phoenix, Minnesota, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, New York City, they're all declaring states of emergency. The National Guard has been mobilized. It's something that I have not seen in my life since I was a little boy. And the last time I remember it was in 1968, in the riots that followed Dr. King's assassination. We are a church that is gathered this morning in a moment of great political tension in a moment of great political danger. And I think for us, the question is, as people who are gathered into a new community, how are we to respond in this moment? What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to go to the streets and march? Are we supposed to stay home and ignore? Are we supposed to do what the government says? What is it that we are to do? Well. I don't know. I don't know the complete answer to this. And I don't know what the church is supposed to do, but I'm pretty sure I know what you and I are supposed to do as individuals. And that is to follow, as the presiding bishop calls it, the way of love. We are to act with love towards all in our community. We are to overcome evil with good. That's what Jesus said. That's what Peter says in the lesson that we heard last week in 1 Peter. We must learn to overcome evil with good. We must love our neighbor, and we must love our enemy. That actually does change things. It has changed things in the past, and it will change things again. Look, Dr. King told the truth. Dr. King was a prophet. That's what the word prophecy actually means, literally. It means truth-telling. When Dr. King told the truth about what was going on in America, about the racial inequities, about the economic inequities, about the class differences, 
He was convicting people. But he was also saying to them, the way to actually make change is not through violent means, but it's through non-violent witness. He recognized that people would sometimes react in violent ways. And he was careful to understand why they did that, though he never said that that was going to be effective or useful. If you were going to march with Dr. King, you had to be able to be trained in nonviolent resistance. You had to be able to love the people, the police, who were persecuting you. And if you couldn't do that, he wouldn't let you march. There were lots of people who wanted to walk with King that weren't able to do that, and they were invited to support him in other ways, but not to make a physical witness with their bodies. And it was that discipline, that Christian discipline, Elijah Cummings, some of the people who are in Congress now, that made with their bodies, that convicted the world, and helped them to see that things must change. It's going to be that today, I think. Because trying to stand up in violence, against violence, just leads to death. It leads to hurt. It leads to chaos. Chaos is not what God wants. There are forces in this world that want chaos. Jesus calls them the ruler of this world, the principalities and powers of this world, which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. Remember, we all talk about rejecting those in our baptismal covenant. What we're being asked to do is to live a life that witnesses to nonviolence, live a life that witnesses to love, live a life that would be what Jesus would do. You know, in the book of Acts, which we're going to be reading in a little, for a little bit here, the book of Acts just says that we were called Christians, which literally means little Christs, as a way of making fun of us. Because what kind of person would actually go and offer themselves to be persecuted, believing that there was going to be a recompense and a judgment that showed that we were right? The Romans couldn't understand that. But Christians accepted that title, and that became the way they understood themselves, to be little Christs carrying their crosses in imitation of what God would have us do. That's my message to all of us this day, on this Feast of Pentecost, when the church began clearly to proclaim Jesus is Lord, Caesar is not. We will follow Jesus. We will pick up our crosses and go after him. He has gone ahead of us, and we will follow where he leads. This is our call. And it becomes incredibly important all of a sudden this year. In your bulletin or in your Book of Common Prayer on page 358, I invite you to join with me as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for freedom, justice, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel, and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Nicholas, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. For our fellow parishioners, Derek, Alex, Gus, Ernie, Ruby, Marie, Trish, Jean, and Garmenu. We also pray for Harriet Cho, Dorothea Evans Gordon, James Green, George Clinton, Anne Marie Serda, Medea Cooper, Tate Sirleaf, Francis Tate, Clarence Scott, Mary Triforos, Eric and Irene T, Barbara Kay, Anthony Eek, Margaret Mirren, Karen Mirren, Carola Chappelle, Susanna, Joan, Mary Beth Snedden, Michael Blake, Chris, Margaret Barney, and Angela. We pray for all healthcare workers, first responders, and those who serve the community during these challenging times. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. For our chance to gather together. We pray for all those who celebrate birthdays this week, especially Rosetta Evans and Barry Turley. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants, Rosetta and Barry, as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. We will exalt you, O God, our King. Praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.